Hello, welcome to White David Gardening and Worm Flower. Today we're going to be discussing Japanese beetle and tomato orange worms because these can be very devastating in our gardens. Hi, Sian. How is your evening going so far? It's probably night where you are, right? Right, so as I said, we're going to be discussing Japanese beetle. So what are Japanese beetle? Okay, you said yes, it's night where you are. Yes, yeah, so what are Japanese beetles? These are members of the scarab beetle family, meaning that they have stout bodies and many of them tend to have metallic color. They can measure anything from 1.5 to 160 millimeter in length. Hi, Han White. Japanese beetle, the haddles, they can measure anything between 15 millimeters in length and 10 millimeters wide. Now, how can we identify Japanese beetle? The haddles are said to have iridescent metallic copper colored wings while their abdomen and their head tend to be metallic green and they have white turf here around their sides and close to the rear of their abdomen. Now as we go further on in the discussion you're going to learn why it is so important to learn about these Japanese beetles. They're the Japanese beetles' eggs tend to be oval in shape. So I'm going to let you know how you can identify the various stages of the Japanese beetle. Their eggs are oval in shape and white. It's about uh, 1.5 millimeters long and it's usually found about 8 centimeters beneath the surface of the soil. The larva is C-shaped, creamy white. It is a grub and it tends to have a yellowish brown and it is under 2.5 centimeters when it is mature. The larvae can be found in the root zone of the host plants. The grub can be distinguished from others by the V shape that is arranged near the last two rows of the spine on the last segment of the body. As for the pupa, it is about the same size like the adult Japanese beetle, except that the legs, the antennae, and the wings are folded more closely to the body. Oh, hi, mom. The body of the Japanese beetle has a pale creamish color at first and then gradually it becomes tan and then finally as it reaches the adult state then it becomes metallic green. Now where can these pupae be found? They are usually found between 5 to 8 centimeters beneath the surface of the soil. So you'll notice that the larvae, the eggs, and the pupae tend to be below the soil. The larvae, of course, may not always be below the soil. Now, what is the history of the Japanese beetle? The Japanese beetle are native to the main islands of Japan. They were first discovered in New Jersey in 1916 and then in 1939 they were discovered in Nova Scotia in Canada. Now what are the type of plants that these Japanese beetle affect? 
they love turf soil, um, turf grass, especially the larvae. They will also affect the roots of other types of plants as well. They like to feed on things like grapevine, peach, cherries, plums, apples, apricot, roses, zinnias, corns, soybeans, blueberry, blackberry, raspberry, asparagus, beans, okras, and a wide variety of vegetables, including members of the cabbage family. The larvae loves the root of grass and vegetables while the adult tend to feed on the foliage and the fruits of the plants. Now when these Japanese beetles feed on the foliage of your plants, they eat the soft tissues, but the vein on the veins and the stems are usually left behind. So you'll end up with a skeletal looking plant. Now in Japan, these beetles are not very dangerous to plants because they have a lot of natural predators that will control the population of Japanese beetle. But in other regions, they have been very devastating to a lot of farmers. They are actually very ferocious eaters. So again, we say that the color of the Japanese beetle is that the body tend to be a metallic copper color. The abdomen and the head of the beetle tends to be metallic green. So, and then they will have this little white hairy thing around their bodies, their sides and towards the rear of their abdomen. So this is how you can actually identify them. Now, what is the life cycle of the Japanese beetle and what are their habitats? When one of these beetle feed, the damage that they do is not bad, but the negative thing about one of them feeding is that they will release pheromone plus the natural fragrance of the plants. And this will attract other Japanese beetle and then because a large population of them will come out to feed, then they can wreak havoc on your garden. These Japanese beetle, they can live from anything between 30 and 50 days. So hi, Melanie. Yeah, so they can live, the Japanese beetle can live anything between 30 to 50 days. And the worst part of it is that they are aggressive feeders in every stage of their development so you know sometimes the larvae might not feed as much as the adult or maybe the adult doesn't feed as much as the larvae but with the japanese beetle in every stage of their development they are aggressive feeders the female will lay an average of three eggs in a few inches of soil and they repeat this process every 24 hours which is what makes them so dangerous because if they're laying three eggs every 24 hours and they can live up to 50 days then you're talking about 150 eggs over their life cycle Now the grub life cycle can last up to 10 months. They love to live in well-drained soil and as the time gets cold, then they will dig deeper down in the soil to overwinter. They will overwinter even up to a foot deep into the soil. And then as spring comes, then they will resume their feeding again and they will feed for another three to four weeks. Now, how can you control or get rid of Japanese beetle? The sad thing is that they are extremely difficult to maintain. 
Let's see, Melanie says, whoa, I will look out for them. Yes, they are extremely difficult to contain. And no matter what you do, you won't be able to get rid of all of them, but by controlling the population, you'll be able to reduce the damage that they will do to your garden. So here are some methods that you can use to reduce their population. You can spray beneficial nematodes in the affected area. These will kill the grubs, but while it will kill the grubs, it is safe for other beneficial insects, for animals and for humans. Bt also help to kill grubs, but there are more than one varieties of Bt. So the one that you're looking for is one that is called grub killer or Bt SDS-502. This one will kill the grub, but the regular Bt that we use for pests will not harm them, but this all BTs can be harmful to caterpillars from butterflies. You can also use milky spores. And this is used for long-term control. So it can take two to three years to become effective. But the effectiveness of milky spore powder increase with every grub that it kills. The milky spore powder can be viable for a very long time, for several years. And if you're going to be using this method, then you need to use some other method of control in the interim until the milky spore becomes active. Because like I said, it takes two to three years before it gets active. So things like the BT or the but um, beneficial nematodes, you can use these um, while applying the milky spores. And that will help to control the population until the milk, milky spores start working. Geranium is good for controlling them because it paralyzes them and then this will leave them open to predators. You can use trap crops as well to attract them away from your plants so you don't want to put these trap crops close to your plants you want to put them further away because they're attracted to these plants and so they will go after that and leave your plants alone birds are also good predators of the japanese beetle so you can either plant things that birds like to feed on or you can Put bird feeders in your yard to attract birds and then this will help to control the Japanese beetle population. Things like moles, raccoons, spiders, ants, ground beetle and the stink bugs are predators to the Japanese beetle as well. Now what are some plants that repels Japanese beetle? Some plants that repel Japanese beetles are things like catnips, chives, gen geranium, rue, marigold, nasturtium, garlic, and tansies. And there are much more plants that will repel them as well. Right, so the reason you don't want to have Japanese beetle in your garden <coughs> It's because of the devastation that they can cause on your garden because some in some stages they're feeding on the root of your plant. Oh, hi, Nikki. Yeah. So in some stages, like in the larvae stage, they are feeding on the root of your plant. And then when they have matured into adulthood, they will feed on the foliage and on the fruits of your plants. 
So if you find that you are having these pests, then it is best to try your best to control them as quickly as possible. Because remember, we say that they can lay three eggs per day and their life cycle is 30 to 50 days. So getting them under control as early as possible is your safest bet in protecting your garden from them. Now let's talk about tomato hornworms. Have any of you have ever had to deal with tomato hornworms? I've had to deal with Japanese beetle, but I've never really seen or experienced any problems with the Japanese, with the, sorry, with the tomato hornworms. But I know that a lot of people tend to have problems with them, and so that is why I'm sharing this information about the tomato hornworms. Not you. Okay, well, that's good. Oh, by the way, Melanie, did you get your package? Uh, let's see. So, tomato ironworms, what are they? These are... Okay, Nikki has never had that problem either. Well, that's good. These are caterpillars of the five spotted hawkworm. Okay, not yet. Yeah, I think you should have it any time between now and next week, Monday. Yeah. Right, so the tomato ironworms are actually not worms, but they are the caterpillars of the five spotted hawkworm. Get, they get their names from the dark projection that is on their rear end and because they use tomato plants as hosts. Now, what do these tomato hornworms feed on? They feed on tomato, potato, eggplant, peppers, and moonflower plants. So these are the plants. There are other plants that they feed on, but these are the popular ones. Now the female like to lay their eggs on young leaves near the stem of the host plant. The adults will feed on the nectar from flowering plants. And most of these flowering plants that they are attracted to are actually fragrant and white in color. So hi, Helpy. Hi, Russell. Thankfully, I do not know ironworms. Yeah, that's good. I'm so happy to see that most of you here have never experienced them. Neither have I. I have experienced the Japanese beetles, but yeah. The Japanese beetles seem to be a little bit easier to control. Um, Diatomaceous earth, although it wasn't listed here, is what I use to control them when I had them last year for the first time. And it seemed to work pretty well because within a matter of days, there was hardly any of the beetles on my plants. Let's see, LP says, I had tomato ironworms last year, found a big one and a little one that had a parasitic wasp eating on it. That I was happy about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would be happy to. Do you still want the yellow belly potato slips? Oh, by all means. I'm not going to say no to sweet potatoes. <laughs> Let's see. Beetles really attacked my rose bushes badly last year. Yes, they tend to love roses. Roses and fruit trees and berries. They tend to go for that even more than they do for vegetables. But once we have them, then we have to try our best to control them because they come back year after year if we don't get them under control. And it's difficult to get rid of them. Now, where was I? Yes, we were saying that the huddles feed on the nectar that they get from the flowering plants and most of these plants that they feed on 
produce white fragrant flowers. Now, where do they lay, lay their eggs? The females lay single eggs on the surface of the leaves of host plants in late spring. Okay, I will send as soon as I get your info. Okay, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. So, where was I? Okay, yeah, so we're saying the females lay their eggs on the surface of the leaves of host plants and the larvae hatch within one week. The female will decide where to lay their eggs depending on the risk of it being eaten by predators. Now, how can you identify tomato hornworms? They have eight V-shaped white markings that has no borders. They tend to be, they tend to have dark blue or black horns. And two generations of hornworms can actually exist in a single summer. Now the pupae of these hornworms, sorry, they pupate in, um, in early fall and the adults tend to have very large wingspan. Their wings can be up to 13 centimeters, which is over five inches long. Now, how can you control tomato hornworms? You said you had tomato hornworm last year, help you. What method did you use to control them? So BT is one method that you can use to control the young hornworms. That means they, the young ones are usually under two inches, but the older ones may survive BT. You can hand pick them some people might be afraid to handle them, but they don't bite and they don't sting. So you want to check the top and the outer branches of your plants. And what you're looking for is missing leaves and the tips of their branches being missing. Because that is usually, usually an indication that you have tomato hornworms. You can also look if you find the hornworms themselves. And remember, you can identify the hornworms because they have eight V-shaped mark on their bodies. And these markings do not have any borders. And they tend to have dark blue or black horns. Braconoid wasps are parasites to hornworms. So they feed on the inside of the hornworms and they will lay their eggs and the larvae will feed on the hornworms. You can also use a solution of soap and water to spray them. And then after spraying them, you apply cayenne pepper. And this will repel the arc moth, which is what produce, which is what produce the hornworms. Let's see, LP says, I didn't have them very bad. The one the wasp laid the eggs on was paralyzed on the same leaf all summer. The other two I picked off by hand and disposed of them. Okay, good. I'm glad you got them before the population got out of control. You can also plant marigold near to the plant in order to repel these tomato hornworms. Sometimes tomato hornworms can be mistaken for other type of hornworms, but the V, that those eight Vs are what set, set them apart from other types of hornworms, like the tobacco hornworm. Now, how long does 
hornworm live? Let's see. LP says, at first I didn't see the hornworm. It was the same color as the leaf. Yes, some of them tend to be green. It was the same color as the leaves. What tipped me off was a branch of their little, a bunch of their little black droppings on the leaves. They are round, but almost squarish like droppings. Okay. Well, that's a good thing to look out for. I think I will just jot that down so I, if I see those droppings, then I can have a clue. Yes, um, how long they live for? You are right, Nikki. They live for two to three weeks. That depends on how warm it is. Now, what are some predators that feed on tomato armworms? As LP says, wasp is one of them. So the braconoid wasp will feed on the inside of the tomato armworms. Ladybugs and green lace wings also feed on them. Let's see, LP says, I had heard that somewhere, I had heard that somewhere, so when I saw them, I started looking for the worms. The droppings are pretty obvious once you know to keep an eye out. I also heard keep an eye out for chewing damage. Okay. I've also heard that people go out with black light at night to find them. Yes, um, I came across that information about using black light to find them at night. But I don't really know what black lights are. I'm going to have to look that up. I didn't really have a lot of time to do research on what it is, but... If it is an effective method that works, then good. Okay, so uh, this is the information that I have on the Japanese, the Japanese beetle and the tomato hornworms. So what are you guys up to for your garden this week? As most of you or all of you on the live may, may know, I won't be having a live on Friday and I won't be uploading any videos for this week. So this is my last um, upload for the week. I will be back on Monday for the next gardening live. I'm taking the week off because I need to rest. I haven't taken a break since I started YouTube, since I started YouTube seriously last year, March. So I'm taking a week off. So during that time, I'm going to be focusing on those plants that I haven't started yet, that should be started in March. I'm trying to get those out of the way. Let's see, today's the 22nd. That means there are more plants. To, okay. It's a good thing I remember there are a lot of plants that is supposed to be planted starting the 23rd. I didn't remember about them because I started the ones that are most important to me, my tomatoes and peppers and my sweet potatoes and stuff like that. But I'm doing them in succession planting. So because of that, every two weeks I'm supposed to plant some. So this weekend coming, I'm supposed to plant more peppers and tomatoes. But... I forgot that there were other plants that I needed to get started this week. So I'll be working on that and I'm doing a massive cleanup of my yard because I'm going to be redesigning it. I want to make a little play area for my kids. And since as my daughter doesn't really like to settle down with her online school, if I'm not there, she'll play games. So the teacher is saying I have to sit with her and to sit with her means I don't get any work done unless I'm doing research. 
I write in my book. So I'm going to have to create a play area outside where she can do her schoolwork while I'm working out there. So it won't all be in vain. Let's see. Um, Nikki says, I can understand that I started YouTube June 2020 and I really haven't taken a break yet either. Yes, when you're in that initial growing state, it's kind of not easy to take a break as you want to get yourself established and then you can think about resting afterwards. But it is important every once in a while to take a little break. It doesn't have to be anything long. See, LP says, Prepping my yard for new beds. Oh, nice. I am, I'm out of space. <laughs> I'm out of space to plant. I don't even know if all the things that I have planned to get into my garden this year, if they're going to make it, but I am going to try. I got a few containers from Tracy over there on getting clean on the prairies. And I'm supposed to be putting them outside to plant more stuff in, but I'm rocking my brain trying to figure out where exactly am I going to put them. I know I'm going to get them somewhere, but I don't know where exactly that's going to be just yet, but I'll figure out something. Let's see. Yard redesign. Very nice. Yes. Um, when we bought the property, well, that was a decade ago, there the lawn that we have has never been a nice one and i've tried a lot of things with it and it's just not the best so last year i made about 30 trips to the free compost depot to collect compost and i laid down cardboard and newspaper throughout the entire backyard and cover it with compost and started reseeding it with lawn grass but I'm still not finished with that and the areas that I have done last year, I still need to add more seeds. So I have quite a lot of work and then I have a lot of things that I brought from the construction site last year and I'm going to have to find some way to either use them or get rid of them. So I have a lot of work in front of me. I think that's going to take about three months in order for me to complete the redesigning. I don't even know if I'm going to get it complete because I have to reside. I'm going to be siding the garage so that it looks like the house. So I have a lot of work in front of me, but I'll get it done eventually, one day at a time. Let's see. I still have a lot of cleaning to do. You know what I find amazing? When fall comes, you spend your time, you clean your garden, you clean your yard. The snow comes, the snow melts. And it is as if you did not do any cleaning. I raked the yard. I got up all the leaves that were out there. And as the snow was melting, the amount of leaves that I see out there that I need to rake. And then they're all stuff blowing all over the place that I need to. I don't know. There's just, it's as if the cleanup never ends. But I guess it's worth it afterwards when you are able to sit back and relax and see everything nice and neat and clean. Exactly, the dust and the dirt. Yeah, they always seem to find find a way in. I don't know how. Maybe they grow legs or something, sneaking in the night when we're not looking. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, so... I'm going to be going out after the live to do a little bit of clean up out there. And then I spent some my time last year. I had a lot of lumber that I'm storing. And I spent my time building a nice little storage area. Neat and nice. Only to be told by the fire department that, nope, it's a little bit too close to the building. You have to move it. <laughs> so I guess that is going to have to be another project for this year as well. It's crazy the amount of things that I'm going to have to do. I don't know if I'm going to have as much time for my garden as I would like this year, but we'll see. Some sacrifices has to be made. Melanie says, I spent the day outside today turning the soil. Oh, you reached that stage where you can actually start turning your soil already. And fluffing up my potting soil. Repot. 
some stuff and sowed more seeds. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. Yeah. Or my soil, I think maybe about six inches of it is thawed out. And the rest of it is still frozen. So there's not much that I can get done out there. But I just go out and look at it every day and say, okay, one day soon I'll get there. But it seems as if what we're getting is not really a fake spring after all. I'm not sure, but it's lasting much longer than I anticipated. So we might have an early spring after all. And if that is the case, then... I can get a whole lot more done. Most of the snow is melted. I'm happy for that. It's just the snow that is on the south side of the property that is not melted yet. So like I do every year, I just go um, shovel the snow from the south side and just throw it out on the lawn and let it melt off so that I can get rid of it a little quicker. Let's see. That's a great idea outdoor schooling yes i have to do that if i want to get any work done because i know my daughter she won't settle down she will sit down right in front of me and be playing games if i if i'm not able to see the screen <laughs> yes the little boy he's he's different he he likes to do his school work not that i give him a lot to do but Whatever he gets to do, he'll settle down and do it. But maybe because he doesn't have an electronic gadget looking at to play games anyway. Who knows? Let's see. Russell says, in my raised beds, I stick my finger down two to three inches, then ice. Okay, well, I guess I shouldn't be complaining then about my five, six inches. Yeah. I don't know those. The raised beds on the south side, some of it is still covered with snow. Some of it is still frozen. And I think the only reason why I'm able to go five to six inches down in my raised bed this year or in any of my garden this year is because I had the... Oh my goodness, those kids were right on my curtain. Yeah. <sighs> Yes, it's because I had it about four inches of compost to all the gardens last year. And then I had it two inches of mulch on top of that. So, And then we got the snowstorm in early October. So that created an insulation for the garden. So that is why I'm seeing stuff melting already. So I'm quite happy for that. Oh, took all my seedlings outside today and bring them back in. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, you know what I'm thankful for? When I brought my plants indoors in September last year, they were doing quite well. And then as the time gets colder, got colder, they died most of them i was left with maybe three out of maybe a dozen or more different types of plants so they weren't getting enough sunlight but i noticed that since the start of march every time i propagate more of my sweet potatoes even my scotch bonnet peppers and my um, garlic they are in the same location on the shelving that I have for them. And they're doing quite well. I don't have the peppers on the grow lights anymore. And they're doing quite well. So I don't know if it's because the time got warm. So with what little light they're getting by the window, it's producing some heat. So they are doing pretty good. So I'm happy for that. Yeah, so now I have space, room to plant more things that needs the grow light. So during the course of this week, while I'm taking a break from YouTube, I'm going to be setting up my lights in my garage, in my little greenhouse. And then I'm going to be testing out a few plants to see how well they're going to do out there if it is warm enough for them to be in the garage just yet. Yes. So I'm going to be having some fun cleaning up the yard and working on my little greenhouse this week. 
Okay, so this is all that I have to discuss. I don't know if you guys have anything else that you want to talk about. If not, I'm going to close down the live and go outside and get some work done. I was supposed to get a lot of work done outside yesterday, but oh my goodness, it was warm. It was, I think, maybe two or three degrees above, but we had over 38 kilometer wind. It was terrible. I could not get anything at all done out there. I was going outside and my husband saw me in ski pants and he said, it's not, it's not, it's not that cold out there. <laughs> and when I went out there, my face was just so cold. It was two degrees or so above, but it was cold. So I was happy I wore my ski pants because I didn't want to be cold out there. Let's see, LP says, that's great. I thought about taking seedlings out, but didn't manage. Planting yarrow seeds right now. Blessed with my first mosquito bite this evening. Oh, <laughs> it must be pretty warm where you are that you can have mosquitoes already. Our mosquitoes usually don't come out until the latter part of June, July. Yeah, but it's when they do come out, they come out with a vengeance. And my husband and I, we don't call them mosquitoes here because when we first came to Canada and saw them, we were like, oh my God, these are flying cows because <laughs> they're big. <laughs> yes, I'm not looking forward to them either, Nikki. Don't worry yourself, you're not alone. I'm not looking forward to them at all. Last year wasn't bad with mosquitoes, but the, la the two previous years, it was terrible, especially by the lake. It was awful. But mosquitoes weren't too bad last year. I guess because the year was more on the cooler side rather than the warmer side last year. Yes, flying cows, that was, that's what we call them because they're just some huge mosquitoes. And then you don't see one or two of them. You see a large swarm of them. My skin is itching as I'm talking about those mosquitoes. <laughs> yes. Oh, hi, Garden State. How are you? You came on just as we are getting close to closing down the live let's see did you say that you were going out to work in your yard it's dark here oh no 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 it's not dark here it's not dark here i'm going outside to work in the yard sorry i missed your reply I had to deal with a moody bird <laughs> doing well i'm going back to listen have a good break okay thank you russell Yes, um, it is actually quite sunny outside. Um, Saskatchewan is known for its, its bright sunshine. And when it is spring, our sunshine can last anything from you wake up. It will wake you up at 4 in the morning. And when 11 o'clock at night, it is just, that's when it gets dark. But it, we are not at that stage yet. We... I think somewhere within the five o'clock bells now, it is bright, sunny, and sometime around 7 38, 8 o'clock, it will start to get dark around there. Yeah, so this is a statue on the, sum the winters, you can have two hours of sunlight, and then the summer, the sunlight can be like 16 hours of day even more than that sometimes yeah so i'm gonna go now i'd like to get quite a few work done because i didn't get anything done yesterday because of the wind and then today because i have to be sitting in and monitoring my daughter so now i'm gonna have to go and try to get as much as possible done 
Okay, so thank you all for participating in the live. I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening. Some of you, it might be night where you are. Thank you so much for the info. Okay, you're welcome, Nikki. Okay, bye, Russell. Same to you, Mom. Have a good night. <laughs> yes. So, bye, everyone. Let's see. Jenny Sullivan says, I live in Calgary now. I lived in Calgary, now in Toronto. You are kind of in the middle with very different weather. Yes. So true. Let's see. Take care. See you soon. Okay, says thank you very much. Enjoy your garden and time off. I look forward to your return. Oh, yes. I'm sorry about that, Janice. <laughs> I call you Janice. I know that Canadian says Janice, but in Jamaica we say Janice. My sister-in-law is Janice. So do not be offended if I say Janice. That's how I'm used to pronouncing it. It's kind of difficult for me to adjust to Janice. Yeah, so um, Janice, you can catch me. My next live will be, I won't be having one on Friday because I'm taking a break. But my next live will be Monday at 5 p.m. Saskatchewan time. Okay, so take care, everyone, and have yourself a wonderful evening.